Hey, this is David Naughton, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neal, and I'm joined by Slava Sukerman, writer and director of the cult classic Liquid Sky. How are you doing? Okay, okay. Good, good. And uh, let everybody know this Wednesday, uh, there'll be a 35 millimeter screening of Liquid Sky at the Boston Underground Film Festival, and you can find out the information at bostonunderground.org. So, um, uh, first of all, like, uh, when you came here, was it hard for you to come from Russia to Israel and then to the United States in the seventies? Well, it, it's a pretty complicated question because, uh, it wasn't physically hard, but it was uh, a big risk. You then at that moment, and you apply for immigration, you don't know what will be result. You can get permission and you can uh, get, get, uh, uh, permission to go other way to Siberia. <laughs> it, could, <Right. laughs> it could happen as well. And especially the moment was pretty tough. They made a new law that you should pay for your higher education. And I had two higher educations. I, I was educated as an engineer and then as a film director. So if I would pay, uh, I would never be able to pay. I probably didn't. The amount of money they, they, they asked asked everyone to pay in order to migrate was was probably higher than all the money I made in my life. Mm-hmm. So so it was a very big risk, but I had the feeling, as many other my friends, that that this political situation should change because Nixon was planning to go to Russia and they would, you know, before Nixon would come they would let everybody who applied go. And it happened to be true. Uh, we got I got the, me and my wife and some the many other people got the permission to leave and we left. Of course, if we left. We could 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 take. I think I don't remember how much. I think it was permitted to take two hundred dollars, and that's all the other money you were, whatever you had, you were giving to state everything. They mm-hmm. they were leaving. They were letting you go like with two hundred dollars. That's so. all. <laughs> so I don't know if it uh, was hard or not. We didn't feel that it's hard. We felt we felt happy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for Liquid Sky, I mean, the, the, a lot of it is uh, like the New York punk uh, culture at the time, and the uh, and clubs and stuff. How did you get uh, How did you get involved in that? Coming from you know another country. Well, uh, I came not to Los Angeles, but to New York, because I believed in the possibility of making low-budget independent films, because I always, it's a long story, but I had a long, in Russia, I had a long story of making very low-budget films. I knew how to do it. And I understood that practically nobody who is not from England or Australia really could make a career in Hollywood, no, no newcomer from other country, unless at least even even those who already had successful commercially uh, films in American distribution, even they had big problem to get into Hollywood. So I thought that that's the only way is to make to make film is to go to New York and became independent filmmaker and you know study life. I, I knew that it's like three four years at least uh, to become able to to make American film to become Amer- to become American enough to make good American mm-hmm. film. So it was like pre-planned. I tried to make films. It didn't work. Then for one film, I managed to raise uh, money for development. And it was uh, when then I met Anne Caroline. She said that the film I'm doing is a real new wave film. But I didn't know. I mean, I didn't call it new wave. I just was making what I like to, to make, science, science mm-hmm. fiction film. And it, the film didn't happen because finally our investor decided not to not to put money into the film. And but he spent some money for development. We started from casting, and Bob Brady, who's playing in Liquid Sky, professor of acting, who was a real professor. That's he, that's himself. That's his life. He was a professor of uh, of acting and and was the best kind of. Uh, best kind of casting director for New York independent film because, you know, like a lot of people were his students, a lot of actors which were good for me. So he became casting director 
and uh, he still was a professor. And every evening, all his students were getting in his big loft for dinner, and this was a good company. And my, me and my wife became part of this company. This company was very much, and Carlyle was among them. Not only and Carlyle was a, a big, big circle of people who were both. Uh, some of them were long time part of Andy Warhol's crowd. Others were part of new, new life, like Anne Carlyle was one of leading new wave fashion models. So we just got to this circle. And then uh, the first film didn't happen. I decided that I should make a project where I would use all these people. And uh, so that's how the idea of Liquid Sky came to my mind. But it was, it was interesting. You know, me and my wife were older than these people, and we were from Russia, but mm-hmm. we never felt like we are something, you know, opposite to them. And they never felt this way. They always considered us as, as an equal friends. As equal mm-hmm. friends. Yeah. So uh, why I found, uh, I do think that all the, uh, all, all, all this, type of uh, movements of young people are the most interesting thing because that's that's how new style of life comes to come, comes comes to the world and uh, 60s changed the world very much because it all started from hippie so the punks and new wave in in 70s uh, 80s were from my point of view were the most interesting movement which would determine the uh, the style of future which I think did happen so it was very interesting to me to make film about his life yeah did you did you stay in contact with any of those people after you made the movie well Anne Carlyle still is the closest friend and we write a mm-hmm. script with her uh, some people we meet uh, still meet not much but a lot of these people are not not around anymore. Yeah, that's unfortunate. When when did you and Anne start writing the movie? And okay, like, okay, how, okay. how did that when, come about? Well, that's when that's easy to answer. Actually, and uh, my wife, she's a was educated as a scriptwriter as well, and she uh, was writing her own script. Actually, wrote her own script about a woman who cannot have orgasm, has this problem, cannot have orgasm. But my wife, who came with me from from Russia, she felt that her dialects are not, not good enough, her English is not good enough. So then Anne became our friend. She immediately uh, asked them to help her to finish the script. And Anne really moved with us in our loft. So, uh, I mean, uh, every, every evening we had dinner and, and at this dinner they 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 discussing question of female orgasm and all the feministic questions. I was part of these discussions. And then the idea of liquid sky came to my came to my mind. Uh, where did the where did the term liquid sky come from? Is is that an actual term for, for heroin or is it not? No, 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 no. I mm-hmm. I think in one of in one of historical books, I, I read a long list of metaphors that people used in ancient time for euphoria, and one of this uh, one of this uh, you know synonym uh, not synonym so this name for euphoria was liquid sky, and I loved it. Uh, it had it, it wasn't in use in America at all. I mm-hmm. I introduced it. To, <laughs> right. After that, a lot of uh, a lot of I, I read a lot of articles that that was a name for heroin. It's not true. Uh-huh. Maybe now I don't know, <laughs> but back right. then obviously nobody <laughs> knew this expression. Yeah. Right, you could take the credit now for for, for right. naming it. Yeah. Uh, right now, you know, now if you open uh, open Google. Google Liquid Sky, you see that no film has this amount of, you know, amount of mentioning. It's several millions mentioning. Yeah. And it's not only film there, but everything which is not the film, there is like a type of lighting equipment and several rock and roll groups. A lot of, uh, some companies, some design companies which use the name Liquid Sky. Uh, and obviously they took it from our film because because this uh, this uh, expression wasn't used before. Yeah. Uh, did you get involved at all in the, in the, in the drug scene at that time? No. No. Actually, actually, 
uh, actually speaking a lot about only me, well, I mean, what 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 to call drug scene? I could, you know, I can, you know, in the company, I can smoke, I, I can smoke marijuana or something sure, like that. Sure. But that's not in Walmart, I guess. That's uh, mm-hmm. just regular American life, right? Yeah, especially nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I was involved in drugs. And I can say more. The, uh, you know, I, I hear as well very often, oh, you probably had a lot of fun making Liquid Sky with drugs and all that. Well, Liquid Sky was, was the, it, at that moment in New York, Liquid Sky was the only drug-free film production. Nobody oh, wow. used, nobody used uh, the, the cut. Cocaine was fake, made out of sugar. <laughs> not, not, no real drugs were on the set. Actually, I think it would be completely impossible because we were shooting like average 18 hours a day. It was mm-hmm. very hard, hard work. Yeah. So when you were writing uh, the movie with, with Anne, was she always going to be in the movie? Was that role written for her? Yes, absolutely. It was written for her and based on her life, on her real life. And actually, most of other characters was based on the real life of our friends who were planned to play these roles. It was one of my ideas that film should be, uh, everybody should play himself or herself, actually. Mm-hmm. Even, and we didn't know how to write some part of the script. We were inviting this future actor for dinner and provoke their close situation to get what they would say. Mm-hmm. So how about the music in the movie? Because I think the music, was that music that was around at the time or was it you know different than what was going on in the clubs? Well, I had a very strong idea what kind of music I want. And uh, it should be elect- very electronic and naive, like a circus music. And uh, I tried to find an electronic composer who would write the music. I still have somewhere a big box of all the Dima tapes of the all the New York electronic composers. None of them understood what I mean. They didn't want to write primitive music. They wanted to mimic big symphony orchestra uh, as it was done by what was this? Carlos, composer who worked with, uh, with Stanley Kubrick. Mm-hmm. So it was great for Stanley Kubrick's films, but I, I needed something else. And at this moment, computer music didn't exist. It all was done with the primitive of the synthesizers. Mm-hmm. So, so I couldn't find a composer. And then, uh, and, and then somebody told me that just first two, like three of these new special musical computers were made called... Uh, uh, called uh, uh, compute, uh, Firelight Computer Musical Instrument. And there mm-hmm. are two of them in a new organization which was called PASS, uh, uh, Public Access Synthesizers. It was a place where for small money young, comp- young, young musicians could use synthesizers. And there were two the boy and girl there, young composers who were authorized, authorized by the constructors to use this machine and teach others how to how to use it. Mm-hmm. So I came to them and invited girl because I always prefer to work with women. Invited girl to write music. Uh, we started with Brenda Hutchinson, and the boy was Clive Smith, and we started working. Uh, she had completely different tastes from mine, and at certain point she said, "Listen, it looks like you know so well what you want. Why won't you write the music yourself?" I said, well, maybe it's my only choice. I have no other choice. But can I come to to this place, pass, and for money you would put what I would say to the computer? She said, yes, of course. So I moved there, and then Brenda left uh, to California, and I started working with Clive, with whom I, to tell the truth, had more more uh, close tastes. It was easy to work with him. And that's how this music was written. I always loved music very much, but I never had any musical education. I cannot read notes and I cannot uh, play any instrument. Uh So I'm inside of me also writing music, but I never took it seriously. (laughs) Uh, That's happened. That's you know. That's how how it happened. 
Yeah. Have you have you uh, done any music since then? Is it something uh, once even, you learn? It? Really, again, not though. I've had a lot of proposals of different rock and roll musicians to to work together with them. I always uh, loved it and you know was very pleased, but never it's never happened. But right now, then with. Then I finally the idea how to make Liquid Sky 2 came. It was strong, strong, uh, you know, decision from my side that Liquid Sky 2 I should write music myself. Yeah, uh, how about like the fashion and the and the makeup in the movie was is that something that uh, everyone was already wearing at the time or was it? No, uh, no, it didn't exist at all. Actually. And we started production because we almost, you know, our budget was very, very low. I thought I would use some, uh, like a girl who was making costumes for nightclubs. A very, very, uh, very fast, I realized that it's impossible that the film should work film professionals. And happily, happily, my DP, who just came from Russia, who whom I knew from 15 years, his 15 years old. He was a, you know, he was a photographer genius when he was 15. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to work with him, and after I left Russia, he already shot a couple of big, big films, high-budget films. And uh, then he came to America, finally. He came with his young wife, who was a fashion designer, who already made several, uh, several, you know, big films as well as a costume designer. So, uh, so it was natural, and she participated in all our pre-production work. So it was natural to uh, to involve her as a designer. And and it's you see, I I had some clear ideas, as I said, with everything, with music, with image, what I want from my film. But of course, a making film is a collective work, and uh, and we work together very uh, pretty long, working out working out the style. And actually, I had this strong idea, which was telling to Marina that costumes should be, after that, should become public popular. I mean, it was after uh, Liquid Sky was like, I mean, a year or two years. Uh, uh, after Woody Allen's Any Hall, which really changed fashion around. Mm -hmm. And I took it for the example, I said, well, it will happen. And actually, like in the year after Liquid Sky, Marina and I were walking in the street passing Bloomingdale's, and we've seen in the window of Bloomingdale's costumes exactly like from Liquid Sky. And we were very proud. Yeah. Do you think something like that is, uh, you just kind of foresaw that would happen? Or do you think uh, the actual fashion was influenced by your movie? Yes, it was it was influenced by the movie. Obviously, uh, movies all was uh, influenced. It's not the like, Liquid Sky is not the first case like that. It's natural <laughs> films are very influential in our in the world today, and a lot of fashions started because of movies. Yeah. So uh, actually, well, well, well it doesn't mean that it wasn't a part of the general uh, sure. general style development of the world, mm -hmm. but but I do think we started it. Yeah. So uh, do you still live in New York? Yes, in the yeah, same uh, place. Oh, really? Uh, how different uh, is it for, uh, now for, from that time? Well, it's very, it's very different. Uh -huh. uh, not only my living, because it's, uh, you know, I'm living in the, in the area of Union, Union Square, and then they moved before, before starting Liquid Sky. moved there. It was a terrible duty. Uh, dirty area with, uh, with, uh, with with junkies in the streets mostly. Now it's one of the most fancy areas of New York, so it changed very much. Yeah. But but New York itself changed. It became you know cleaner, more bourgeois. Uh, New York of 1982, 83 was uh, was a dirty city with, uh, with the prostitutes in, in, on 42nd Street, but uh, but artistic life was on the top. I think was at that moment uh, like uh, America, like New York experimental theater was best in the world. Galleries were best in the world. Everything was in you know, the moment. There's so whorehouses with prostitutes, and new galleries were in the same buildings. So we were neighbors. It was like one very crazy world. Yeah. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anymore. 
And I understand people who like the new clean New York, but I have nostalgia for, obviously, nostalgic for New York Oasis. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so I know it's going to be playing at uh, at Boston Underground uh, Film Festival uh, this yeah. Wednesday, and it's also uh, coming out in April. Uh, the restoration, the 4K restoration from uh, Vinegar right. Syndrome, and uh, right. so, uh, how did that come about? Who came to? You? Did you come to them, or did they come to you for uh, to do the restoration? Well, I, you know, uh, I, I I wanted to do it for a long time because we never had Blu-ray. And I had proposals from a lot of a lot of different distributors. Practically, I think the all the distributors which can distribute independent films, all of them I, I had some negotiations with. Um, mostly, they, uh, as most of the distributors, wanted complete control for many years, and I didn't like it because it's you know, it's your movie. Uh, Liquid, Liquid yeah. Sky is a very special baby for me, and I wanted mm-hmm. to keep as much control as possible. So, uh, so I like I, I like vinegar syndrome. Then they came to me, not I came to them. I didn't know about the existence, mm-hmm. and I liked uh, first of all that they didn't want the long term and they didn't want complete complete control, and they obviously it looked like they know how to how, how to digitize and restore films. So. So that's that's how it was decided. Yeah, and I saw their their version. Uh, sent me one for for review, and it looks uh, looks beautiful. You know, all, all the color, very vibrant colors. And uh, have you and seen it, a copy yeah, of it? I think it, I think it was the right time to do it because uh, people, for some reason, uh, which surprises me, uh, a lot of audience want to see thirty five millimeter. They prefer to see all. 35 millimeter print, mm-hmm. but uh, for me, digitizing liquid sky was like a discovery for myself because a lot of things you, you cannot you cannot see on a bad had very bad DVD made from the master of uh, of first vid, video copy of the film made you know 35 years ago. Yeah. Certainly, it was very bad quality, and digitizing really brought all the. Actually, I think it does bring more more detail of negative than thirty five millimeter print. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was watching something, I noticed um, uh, there's a lot of violence and sex in the movie, and I think the violence is more graphic than the sex. Is was that something intentional? Yes, because that's the film about it. That's the film about. Uh, uh, about abuse in a big sense and sex. I mean, uh, some you know was the, the, film, the, the film opened in uh, in Chicago. I was there. I had huge press conference and a lot of questions. And one of the questions was why sex is not attractive in liquid sky. You don't you know don't want to fuck up this liquid <laughs> sky. Uh-huh. I said that it's not the purpose of any any feature film. It's the purpose of pornography. Liquid sky is not pornography. And you know even Hollywood uh, made film which sex sexually excited. That's like an erotic film so that's done with this idea. Liquid sky is not done with this idea. And uh, and then uh, then this uh, next next day. This uh, one of these writers who asked me this question. He in one of Chicago papers, he made a huge, huge. You know, it was like on top of the, maybe even on the front page, big, big line. Zuckerman, Columbus, Hollywood films are made to you know made as a pornography, which I never never said. Mm-hmm. Just if you're making satire, it's probably not the right, uh, not not the right place to sexually excite. Uh, the, the Margaret is abused, and she, mm-hmm. and that's the big part of this of this plot. Actually, today the abuse became the subject. I'm proud that we probably were among the first people who who brought attention to the fact that women are mm-hmm. regularly abused, and actually, then we plan. Plant Liquid Sky 2, that was the biggest, biggest reason for that. One of the main things in, in the Liquid Sky 2. 
Yeah, which is very topical today. Um, um, abuse yeah, to, that's to what it. I yeah. said. Actually, yeah. it's, I, I don't like it very much. I think we should do it earlier because people would think that it's because it's topical, we're making liquid sky too. Right, but that's right. not used with what's, you know, what's the idea long ago. Yeah, so um, what you said about uh, liquid sky too. Uh, are you actually, is that in the works? We already almost finished the script. Oh, wow. I, I don't want to finish it before I know exactly what will be the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, but we still didn't start raising money, so I thought that it's probably better to start after re, you know, re-releasing of the film. Actually, it's not only not only Liquid Sky 2. I almost was speaking about music. I all, I'm as well working on making stage musical out of Liquid Sky. Mm-hmm. So, uh, will the changes of New York be part of uh, of the sequel? Mm, it's not about uh, you know. It's maybe on the maybe sit some way on, uh, on the background of film, but that's, that's not the subject of the film. So I sure. don't thought about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, relationship, uh, relationship between people, and especially abusive relationships. That's important. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's changed much. Yeah, you think it's changed? I think uh, I do think that the really there is a progress, is. and the, the new scandals about abuse are part of this progress. Mm -hmm. So, now, you know, obviously in the movie there's an actual alien, but did you ever kind of see Margaret as an alien uh, within her own world, since she doesn't? Absolutely, uh, yes, doesn't she... yes, yes, yes. Actually, I guess we we made some some jokes there, some plays with words with different uh, different meaning of word alien. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, uh, it's it is part. Yes. Yeah, because even you know, in the movie, she's pretty much uh, disinterested in sex with human beings, and at the end, that uh, you know, it's something new for her. Well. I don't know. I mean, I do. I, I like ambiguity in films. Sure. I love Stanley Kubrick is my favorite director. And one of the reasons is that he is always ambiguous. He never, never uh, divides his heroes to bad and good guys, and he never has a clear an uh, ending. So people often ask asking me what's happened with Margaret. If she's alive or she's dead, she went, mm -hmm. she went to other planet, or what's really happened with Margaret? And I'm saying I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, I, I like that in a movie too, because then if you watch with friends or something, you could talk about it afterwards and everyone has their own, you know, take on what happened. Right, 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 right. I like it too. Yeah. The films like that. Mm -hmm. I think films, I films, fil films, not supposed to teach people uh, something. I don't like propaganda. I think so. Films should raise the questions and make people think. Yeah, definitely. Which honestly, I think all art should do that. You know, not just movies. Absolutely right, right, right. Uh, I do have a kind of a, a silly question: Is uh, w what's with uh, all the shrimp in the in the in the uh, scene where the, they're ordering Chinese food and everything they order is shrimp? Well, it, it just happened, I think, during our rehearsals, then uh, Susan, who played the role, was ordering, and she uh, she ordered two shrimps in the role, and I said, oh, it's, uh, you know, let's keep keep ordering shrimps, keep ordering shrimps. <laughs> and that's the way I remember it. She remembers it differently, actually. You see this new release DVD Blu-ray, there is a documentary I made, made about making Liquid Sky. And there Susan telling her story how this idea of shrimps was born. I, I, nobody remembers this thing, so it's just happening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what was your reaction like uh, once you released the movie and, 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 and when you're watching the movie with an audience? Oh, it was, uh, it was very, very exciting, especially the release in New York, because I'm try hard to, you know, we had no, it was independent distribution and we had no much money for publicizing. So it was pretty difficult, but I studied what, what other filmmakers did and had a lot of my own ideas how to, uh, how to make, you know, without my, how to make publicity without money. And one of the things which was done by some people before me was 
was uh, giving away uh, flyers with, with with quotes from 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 reviews, giving away flyers in the lines to to theaters. You know, back then it was the multiplexes. Most of theaters were one just one theater, and, and they had lines in the street before for the beginning of the film. So it was very good to find the film with, which which is interesting to the similar group of audience and while they standing and have nothing to do we were giving them the flyers and and really really it worked because film opened uh, then it was a scissor waverly uh, and uh, i guess the campaign was we well, were asking people how they learned about the film and most of people who came first days were came because of these flyers. Not, the film had a lot of great reviews, but there were more people who, who learned about the film from flyers than from reading newspapers. Mm-hmm. And after several days, uh, everything was sold out and people couldn't get in. That created, that immediately created the interest. And as you know, that's in New York, Boston, and and Washington, D.C., three, three cities. The film played more than three years nonstop. Wow. And, uh, you know, it still plays, obviously, because uh, the screening is this Wednesday. Uh, yes. What do you, th- why do you think, like, uh, new audiences take to it who, you know, weren't well, around at the time? Better, better than the first audience, because the first audience not always could understand. Somebody was telling, like, it's unintentional laughs. They couldn't understand that there's a special humor in the film. Today, everybody understands everything. People are very ex- young people, very excited. They're laughing all the time. They understand every smallest detail in the film. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the reasons I didn't want to deal with some big distributors. Because the idea was to, you know, to show for a couple of days film in the theaters just to to get interest for uh, for DVD, uh, for selling DVD. And my idea was we should try it may work uh, as as a new film with new young audience. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I don't know if still it works because it's very difficult to make. Today, is, first of all, there are like many, many times more independent film released than it was 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's very difficult to, to get audience. But uh, the first screenings were very good, and we are expecting uh, that it will work very good in New York. Yeah. Now, um, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but uh, do you know who Michael Alley is and the club kids that, that kind of uh, uh, grew off, uh, you know, late, later in the 80s in the, in the club scene? Uh, well, I guess a, a lot of them among the Liquid Sky fans, mm-hmm. but there a, lo- a lot of new young people as well. Yeah. Um, how could people, uh, do you have uh, anything online for, for the sequel where people could follow it? No, but for sequel, I think it will appear soon. I have, uh, I have two. I have a page, a Liquid Sky page uh, in, uh, in Facebook, and I have a site, Liquid, Liquid Sky the movie. Actually, everyone who is interested to know what's happening uh, should just open the site and push the button on the, on the first page of the site button to become to become part of the list. And everybody who did it getting from me all the news, all the news on what's happening with Liquid Sky. Very cool. I'll put the link up on very the website. Easy. It's very easy to become to become part of this mail of the list. Yeah. Um, liquid, liquid Sky the movie that that come and actually there is a uh, just uh, just uh, address Liquid Sky the movie at, at Gmail and you can write one can write this address as well. Yeah. Um, was it because uh, you know obviously in the movie people uh, die after having orgasm and stuff? Um, was AIDS uh, was this before like uh, AIDS really came about or was it kind of in the beginning days and yes, did that yes. have any effect? It was at the beginning of AIDS, but before it became uh, this beginning came known to people. The people didn't know that it already exists, so it became known sometime after Liquid Sky. Yeah, was that in your on your mind at all when you were writing not, it? Not at all, because I had no, uh, no idea about it. Yeah, a lot of a lot of things happened, like like AIDS, 
And then another thing, well, the idea that there is some connection between uh, sex and drugs in, in brain was my creative idea. Uh, like in a year or two after that, some scientific research were published which proved that it's really true. Hmm. That's really that's really weird. Like, uh, <clears throat> it makes you wonder if, if they saw the movie or if it's just a coincidence. I don't know. I think when, uh, when films are made, uh, filmmakers, uh, as, as any artist, artists have uh, take like ideas from the air. Uh, they they exist. Ideas exist like 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 physical laws, right? Laws of physics exist before scientists find them. Mm -hmm. They are in the air, and at some point, scientists find them. So so then, artists get some new idea. Writer gets some new idea. It's it's very probable that it's true, that it really exists and will be discovered. So. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any? Uh, are there any? Part of, it's just part of artist intuition. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, are there any uh, current movies that you yourself uh, like? Well, uh, I cannot. Uh, I cannot list one which really very much impressed me. Uh huh. I I cannot list. Yeah. Well, what were some of the ones that that, uh, that influenced you when you came to America? Or did you see American movies before you came here? Well, I've seen a lot of films, and a lot of them influenced me, but uh, the, more, the biggest impression for me was Clockwork Orange, which mm -hmm. actually wasn't shown in Russia. It was very difficult to see in Russia. But, but when I came to Israel... The, one of the first things I made was watching uh, Clockwork Orange, and I couldn't sleep a couple of days after that. It was one of the biggest impressions in my life. Mm -hmm. This is a fantastic movie. It still holds up like uh, anything that, that's uh, good at the time. But uh, I want to thank you for talking to me. It's been uh, a pleasure. And uh, I hope they come out for the uh, the screening this uh, Wednesday at Boston Underground Film Festival. And I believe you'll be in attendance, right? Uh -huh. So the screening is Wednesday. For some reason, I thought that I have more time. Okay. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just have a few days, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Well, I appreciate this. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye. This is Darren Beck of Pinkish Black, and you're listening to Without Your Head.